there's a real reason why you've done this. But I looked at it and I said, wow, they've had a partnership that defied odds, honestly. And now you're you're doing it again. I think we would say this is our culture. And it's the same way that we think about leadership teams. You don't want two of the same people because then it's one plus one equals one. And I don't know what Carlisle did, but my guess is they tried to get two people who were similar rather than really optimizing on the fact that having two very different people means that you get many more ideas. You have the opportunity to to build on a multiplicity of strengths. We have 48 hours in a day instead of 24. The increase in bandwidth, if you really trust each other and that each of you are decision makers rather than having to come back and loop back on everything. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, Insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Welcome to another Walker Webcast. Uh, I am really excited to have with me today uh, the two co-chairs and former co-CEOs of Gensler, uh, Andy Cohen and Diane Hoskins. Um, I'm going to do a quick bio on both of you. And given that your bios sort of overlap one another, I'm going to try not to repeat as I do my bio of the two of you uh, as a incredible dynamic duo. And then we'll dive into a lot of different issues that I'm super excited to talk to the both of you about as it relates to the future of the built world, climate change, autonomous vehicles, the 20 minute city, um, all the great projects your, your team is working on around the globe and the various um, kind of design aspects that you all have in those buildings and many, many other things. And I think one of the things, Andy and Diane, that I also want to spend a bunch of time on as much as there's so much to talk about about the built world is how the two of you have built and led Gensler, because I think as it relates to your firm and the focus that you have on your people, um, it is really when I went to your website, just before I introduced the two of you, when I went to your website, I was expecting to see lots of pictures of your buildings. And you actually have to work to find pictures of your buildings. There are plenty of them once you've kind of peeled through a couple layers, but it's not the buildings, it's the people. And you all have over 6,000 employees around the globe who make Gensler what Gensler is. Um, but I find it to be so admirable that the focus is not on here's this beautiful building that we just built or some great design feature that we've done. But these are the people of Gensler that make those great buildings happen, that great design happen. So and I want to dive into that because I want to hear how you all have done that because it's really uh, it's it, it's quite something. Um, but let me if I can. Uh, um, here we go. Let me pull in here quickly and do a quick intro. Andy Cohen is global co-chair of Gensler, the world's most influential architecture and design firm. He spent his entire 43-year career at Gensler. Since 2005, he and global co-chair Diane Hoskins have exemplified collaborative leadership, overseeing both the long-term strategy and day-to-day -day operations of the global practice known for its award-winning design, innovation, and research. Under their strategic guidance, Gensler has organically grown to become the most admired firm in the field, with some 6,000 people networked across 56 offices around the world, serving more than 3,500 clients in over 100 countries. Uh, Andy and Diane were included on Forbes' inaugural Future of Work 50, recognizing leaders shaping the office of tomorrow. And I want to talk about that. In 2021, they were named to Business Insider's list of 100 people transforming business, which honors business leaders in 10 sectors who are innovating, sparking trends, and tackling global challenges. And he's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a graduate of the Pratt Institute. Diane Hoskins, global co-chair, um, oversees Gensler's global platform and its day-to-day -day operations. Diane is also focused on Gensler's global talent strategies, performance, and organizational development to ensure that they serve their clients with the world's top talent. She is the catalyst for Gensler's research program, for which Diane is committed to delivering value to clients through strategies and innovations like Gensler's Workplace Performance Index. Diane graduated from MIT and holds an MBA from UCLA. She received the Outstanding Impact Award from the Council of Real Estate Women and is both a regent of the American Architectural Foundation and a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Diane sits on the board of directors of Boston Properties, an incredible company run by my friend Owen Thomas, and is a trustee of the MIT Corporation. All right. So 
let me dive in here. Um, I, I wonder how the two of you have been so successful in building Gensler in a partnership. Um, there are not many firms that have been able to not only thrive, but survive with co-CEOs. And I know now the two of you have moved to co-chair roles. And I want to talk about the fact that you replaced yourselves with co-CEOs. Um, but talk for a moment about the hallmarks of your collaborative leadership over the last 20 plus years, because it's really quite something. Well, maybe I'll kick off. I know Andy will have a lot to share on this too. So just to, to get started, first of all, Willie, we're so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us. We feel like we have so much in common with you and this great, the great company you built. You know, you started as a family run firm, now one of the country's largest commercial real estate finance companies. We started as a small family run firm and Andy and I, you know, have had the honor of, of building our firm into a global organization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, we are so thrilled to be able to work with you on some really important and terrific projects that really allowed our teams to be super creative and do some really special things. Hopefully we can talk about your- well, I mean, We can dive down that for a second. Well, and then sure. you can to me, because I think one of the things that's so interesting is doing this conversation with the two of you, having two guests on is always a little challenging for me because I feel like I have to give everyone equal airtime, if you will. And I know the two of you to the extent that I, I don't, I hope I don't have to kind of like go back and say, hey, Diane, what, do you have anything to add on to what Andy said? Because the two of you are so good at both completing one another's sentences and also having incredible trust and respect for one another. But we did, before we jumped on live, we were talking about the incredible work that your team has done for Walker and Dunlop as it relates to creating these brilliant office spaces that our um, uh, Walker and Dunlop uh, employees get such a incredible honor to work in. And this office that I'm in in Denver is our newest collaboration with Gensler. Um, and it is, I have to say, it, it, it's just transformed everything in the sense of how I mean, we were in a old, not an old, it was a relatively, I mean, it was class A space, but it was just a typical office tower downtown. And we moved here to Cherry Creek and we had you all design this new space. And every single person who walks into it says, this is the nicest office space I've ever been in. And that's all thanks to your team and your collaboration with our team in creating this space that many people feel like they're kind of going home. They're like walking into a living room and they can work anywhere and they can bring clients in here. We've got a client event tomorrow where we're doing we were doing an afternoon ice cream social for our team here. And I was like, I'm inviting clients and we've got a whole bunch of clients coming over here to just hang out in this wonderful common space with our people and how great a business development opportunity is that for a bunch of clients to just come over here and hang out and have an afternoon social with our team. But that is what I find to be so interesting about where you all are on defining the office of the future. Absolutely. Uh, by the way, and, and your your office is a perfect example of the workplace of, future, of the future, because it truly is about your leadership and about all about collaboration that and that we'll talk about more about that, about why collaboration spaces and performance spaces really matter for our clients right now, especially after COVID. But Andy, run on that for a second, because you've talked a bunch in the past about making an office somewhere where you want to go, not somewhere where you have to go. What's the you've been branding the office of the future a little bit of trying to get people to kind of image what that actually is. What what are you all doing specifically to make the office of the future? You want to dive in, Diane? Uh, <laughs> You're absolutely right. I know this is the biggest transformation that's happening in workplace and work since the industrial revolution and it truly is about making the office a destination not an obligation like your office a place people want to be not that they have to be and what we're finding through our research and we have what's called the Gensler research institute we do a ton of research on workplace and workplace of the future is about creating that sense of choice for people you know coming from their homes and coming back to work. It's about that sense of choice of where you can perform the best in the office. So what we're doing is we're going into offices and taking out the rows and rows of desks and we're replacing them with living room settings like you were describing in your office, collaboration spaces. What we found during COVID is there was a drop off of 37% of collaboration that was occurring on these damn Zoom calls. 
And the reality is the mentoring and coaching of next generation leaders in your organization really comes from being together and, and collaborating together. And that's been the incredible uh, stress that we're seeing in the marketplace, because only 30 percent of offices today, like yours, have been renovated. So a, the big bulk, three quarters of space people are coming back to are old, antiquated and don't reflect the workplace of the future, the new way of working. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. And Diane, as you has your team learned from the work you're doing in the sense of how's your office participation rate at Gensler? Absolutely. Uh, I'll tell you. First of all, it's just music to our ears to hear your experience with the space that we designed for you right here in Bethesda, in my backyard, and also Denver, now Atlanta. Um, and, and the word that really keeps coming back is this sense of community and really very literally family that we were able to achieve in, in your spaces, you know, uh, we are so proud of the spaces that we're designing for ourselves as well, because, of course, people come to our space and say, well, you know, this should be an example of what's going on out there. So, you know, I'll, I'll speak to our San Francisco office, which is one of uh, our newest spaces that has come online in the last few months. Just a, a tremendous example of everything we're talking about, everything from it's an electrified building to the fact that it's designed with a, a real sense of how people work today and the kinds of spaces that are gonna bring people back to the office. But as Andy said, people are looking when they come back to the office for something very different than, you know, circa 2019. And what is that kind of space? And what are those important parts of, of how I can do my best? You know, people start to really get in touch with, you know, what was missing from the workplace, why they were preferring certain kinds of settings at home. It wasn't necessarily about the geography of downtown versus, you know, my hometown. It was much more about the ability to get more focused work done or the ability to collaborate or the ability to really connect with my community as an organization. And so that's what we really have done. And our, our San Francisco office is an incredible example of this. Love to take you through it if you get out there one day. But, you know, we have we literally there are clients going through that space weekly, if not daily, to see, because I think it is probably one of the best examples in San Francisco, which was having such a tough time as a city, getting people re-engaged with coming back into the office space that here is an incredible, you know, green shoot, if you will, of where things are going and what are those changes. It's so it actually is a pretty amazing uh, you know, set of ideas, everything from a quiet zone. One of the things we've seen, and frankly, it was part of our workplace uh, uh, research that we were finding year after year, probably from about 2013 to our 2019, we do surveys of workers, not people working in Gensler spaces, but literally workers across the US and in every country that we are working in to really understand what's going on with the workplaces out there. And one of the things we saw as a huge outcry from, you know, 2013 was where we saw it spike and it stayed up there was a real sense that people can't get work done in the office, that they were having a problem focusing, right? The fundamental piece of work is the kind of work you need to do to kind of get your, get your work done, not the stuff you're doing with other people. And the fact that that lack of, of space and consideration of focus really started to create a dysfunctional sensibility in the office. So one of the things that is a massive pivot, I believe, and what we're seeing in the spaces we're designing is real intentionality around focus. That plays out in our San Francisco office as a whole zone in like a third of the office is really a quiet zone. 
and people are in there getting work done. And it's designed as this amazing kind of, you know, I'd say like a club, right, where you go in and it's very quiet, right? Everyone's getting work done. Then there's a much more activated space, which is a mixture of things working individually as well as meetings, as well as spaces dedicated for groups and teams. And then it kind of plays out with a more community type space as well. But these are the kind of components. It's going to look and feel differently for different clients because it it also is about not applying the sort of one size fits all where you walk into any office, you see the same stuff. It's got to really, it's got to be authentic it's got to have that sense of it's for you know us and where we're going as a firm, but also recognizing that people need something different today than and their expectations are at a much higher level than what they were five years ago. Andy, Doug will click on that for what Diane just said for a moment as it relates to does it matter industry by industry? Like you all did the Google headquarters in New York. OK, and um, Diane's just talking about your new headquarters in, or your new building, because you both are actually in different sides of the year. One's in L.A. and one's in Bethesda. And so are your your so are your successors, um, interestingly. Um, and I want to get to that at some point. But my, my, my question on that is, does it matter that you're working for Google or for an airline or for Google or for Coca-Cola? In other words, does industry matter on the type of design that Diane just laid out as it relates to focus area, common area? Um, one of the things that was that I noticed in our Atlanta design was that one area where we were having a number of people had no real separation between the workstations. And I said in a Zoom world, People don't want to be listening to the person on the on the on the Zoom next to them. We need something there. And what I learned in that process was that most of my colleagues who are on Zoom calls all day and don't have the beautiful space that I have in our next one, they're doing it with their ear pods. And so they're actually listening to the call and also contributing, but you don't want to listen to the person next to you. And so I actually asked it to be up a little bit. But just for a second, does it matter the sector that the company is in? It absolutely does. And we're seeing, you know, we and we do design trends and research across all the different sectors. And we're, generally speaking, we're seeing more we space than me space. But like you said, because uh, we're zooming into meetings, because many of the people that are in a meeting aren't in the office space, there are definitely other enclosed spaces, two and three person conference rooms. But so there's definitely, a, you know, a differentiation that we see across sectors. For example, some spaces like Google are 95 percent open, meaning they have very few offices except for conference rooms. And other spaces like a law firm, for example, or accounting firm would have much more closed in spaces. I'll just say one other thing that really important because just to dovetail with what Diane said, what we're also seeing is because we keep on hearing that the workplace is being significantly impacted, we're really busy right now because 70 percent of the spaces haven't been improved. But what we are seeing is this flight to quality, this idea that tenants and major Fortune 500 companies that we're working with are looking for fully amenitized buildings and newer buildings. And what that's causing for you and your investors is this issue of, you know, you have A buildings that are completely full, but the B and C class quality buildings are really empty right now. And that's a major issue that's occurring where our clients want to be in safe, fully amenitized buildings, yet it's leaving this unbelievable stock of really challenged B and C buildings, especially in suburban areas. I I wanted to get to this later on, but that's a really good segue to talking about retrofitting and the re adaptive reuse of buildings you you, you know you all have 8000 projects going on around the world so the fact that either one of you knows about pearl house at 160 water street in new york you may or may not but i pulled that out as one of your adaptive reuse projects where you took an office building in new york in 2020 it delivers this year and it's converting that office building into um i think it's uh, it's a, it's it's actually it's a big building i think it's got 500 units or something to it um, and talk for a moment. I mean, you all have gone out and used your own database to identify over a thousand buildings in the United States that are ripe for adaptive reuse. Talk, talk about what you've done on your research, Diane, and whether you're actually reaching out to people and saying, hey, owner of building X, you actually are set to do an actual adaptive reuse for this reason, this reason, this, or are you waiting for them to call you up? And then if you would just talk about Pearl House for a second, because I found it to be such an interesting example that's taken, by the way, four years to convert it, but it looks like a stunning residential building. 
Well, you know, this is such an important topic for us. I mean, on so many levels, but I'll dive straight into maybe research and then take it to application and then, you know, finish building that. uh, And we love Pearl House. Andy and I were in there a few months ago when it opened. And it is it is such a great story. And it really brings to life something that started as a research project at Gensler about six years ago, where one of our team members literally here in Washington, D.C., had done some, you know, kind of bespoke research for a particular client on the idea of, a, of a, um, you know, this kind of a office to resi on a particular project. And it was a great research effort. It got published as a paper. About two years later, uh, a similar topic came up and one of our leaders in Toronto pulled up that paper and built on it and not only took the concept, but turned it into an algorithm and used it uh, to look at an entire portfolio. And it really began to grow as a conversation because this was happening at the same time that we were seeing this you know tsunami of vacancies uh, since COVID, right? And in this entire uh, you know last two or three years in the real estate industry, well, in Calgary it was a thirty percent vacancy rate and a massive housing shortage, and the uh, government of Calgary hired us to look at. Uh, a significant number of buildings in the Calgary area to see if there was potential to convert these buildings from office to residential. So what this tool does that we created is to basically use an algorithm to quickly, literally within a matter of, you know, less than a half hour to score a building based on key, you know, physical dimensions from lease spans to, you know, various kinds of heights to, you know, where is the loading dock to a whole set of things and be able to give the the building a score from zero to a hundred. Basically we say, if it gets above 80, it definitely is plausible as as a physical, uh, you know, transformation. If it's probably 70 to 80, it could still work in New York uh, because they don't mind really thin units, you know, depending on the market. Um, but, you know, again, because of that, the city now offers, uh, you know, substantial subsidies in Calgary for those transformations. Fast forward, that tool began to get the attention of developers in the U.S., and we started presenting it uh, in one-on-ones with developers, as well as in various, you know, platforms, webcast, podcasts. It even made it to has made it to the White House, and we have had meetings with uh, HUD and the White House, and they're coming out with uh, financing that they're going to do to incentivize the transformation of excess office space into the much-needed housing, and you know. This is, an, uh, frankly, this is probably one of the most important trends that's happening. I'm not going to say Gensler started the trend, but I will say that we have been part of helping to accelerate with a tool that can quickly help a developer understand the plausibility and feasibility without having to go into, you know, weeks and weeks of study, but literally within the matter of a half hour and some key dimensions that we're able to come to that, that uh, you know, determination. The Pearl House, which, you know, again, was happening simultaneously with all of this. It's uh, a building of uh, close to 600,000 square feet. There's 588 units in the building of, you know, different sizes. It is remarkable. I mean, I I encourage anyone who's, you know, watching the, the webcast to, if you're in New York, to take a tour because there are some really, really smart things that have been done in the building, amazing amenities, but also from a real estate standpoint, there's really some smart stuff that we did to add FAR to be able to build a couple of layers, you know, floors on the top that were very premium. Um, But at the same time, taking FAR out of the building, being able to add it back at the top. But, you know, again, also putting in, um, you know, various kinds of of, um, features that allowed us to to make the building much more energy efficient. And, you know, again, meeting many of these important New York standards for energy efficiency that are coming online. So, you know, and by the way, it's a giant project. There's one twice that size that we're doing in New York now as well, uh, as well as, you know, I don't want to name drop some of the developers there, but a number of projects that are kicking off across New York, Washington and cities, you know, across the U.S. So I want to um, 
make one comment there, which is this, that you all do 8,000 projects a year. Pearl House was started in 2020. Okay. So we've got 20,000 plus buildings you all have worked on. I randomly picked one building and you knew exactly how many apartment units are in it because I got a note here that says 588 units. So that to me is unbelievable because you didn't know I was going to talk about Pearl House. And you, and of all the things that you and Andy have to look at, you remembered how many units it actually has. Andy, one of the other things out of Pearl House that's interesting is that your calculation is that it by doing the conversion rather than building new on that building, which is 588 units to build a new 588 uh, unit building. And as Diane said, you also added on the top of it. So there is some new construction there, but it saved 20, what is it, 20, uh, it's got a huge amount of carbon, 20,000 metric tons of embodied carbon. So two things there. One, talk about the energy savings, and then let's segue into conservation, global warming, and building for the future of a world that is hotter and um, more challenging from an environmental standpoint than any of us would really like. Absolutely. And, and the Pearl House is a great example of adaptive reuse, right? And the idea that you're saving all this energy because you don't have to build it from scratch. So think of all the concrete that's poured and the steel that's put into a building and concrete and steel are the biggest emitted emitters of CO2 and the fact that we didn't have to do that. So we saved all the, that CO2 emissions by doing the adaptive reuse. By the way, I should mention that on what Diane said about our studies, our algorithm is only around 15 to 20 percent of buildings are actually passed the test to be renovated. So it is specific requirements that make these buildings really work. Yeah. As far as climate change, Diane and I have been big evangelists to this uh, within our firm and, and out, outside the firm. We, we just spoke at the COP28 in Dubai. Uh, and, you know, we both feel very strongly that climate change is the moral and business imperative of our lifetime. What most people don't realize, and the people on your call maybe don't realize, is that 40% of all CO2 created is buildings, more than industry and more than cars. So we take it as the most impactful and largest firm in the world. We worked in over 100 countries last year. We're taking that on as an organization to say that our work, what we've targeted is by 2030, all of our buildings or most of our buildings will be net zero. And that's really important. So we've created the standard in our work that we know we're moving all our work towards net zero. And that and that's essential. And so, uh, you know, there's and there's lots of examples of what we're doing within the industry that make, uh, you know, help the industry along. For example, we created the Genza product standards. So we've created green standards. Think of all the millions of square feet that we design of studs and carpeting and ceiling tiles. So we've created a standard spec that anyone can go on our website and use for green strategies for buildings of the future. But this is a really important subject for us and it's embedded in all of our work. It's interesting, I heard you give a speech, Andy, and you talked about the fact that cement is 10% of total CO2 emissions. And I was sitting there in my mind thinking about the fact that, you know, people like Ed Bastian of Delta Airlines are constantly sort of, if you will, under the gun to make sure that Delta is emitting less out of their planes. And I was like, why doesn't Carlos Slim, who I think owns the largest cement manufacturer in the world, come under the same type of heat if his cement manufacturer in Mexico, which I do believe is the largest, maybe there's a Chinese one that has jumped over it. But um, why isn't he under similar type pressure as someone like the you know CEO of Delta Airlines or some of the other industries that we view to be such big emitters of carbon, uh, where actually the numbers would tell you that the focus needs to be somewhere else? And I and I have to I have to take my hat off to you and Diane for making is such a priority. How do you get to the 300 million metric ton savings of CO2? Is that just a 8,000 projects a year? We're going to do this and that you kind of back into that number of just saying, if we can continue to work on net zero building, we can save that much in that period of time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, again, you have to kind of quantify everything, right? So um, that's, that's a probably a low estimate because that's really talking about emissions on an operational level versus, you know, what you guys were just talking about, which is the emissions that are saved from the standpoint of the materials that we're using. So that number easily doubles, um, certainly when we start to look at 
uh, the new build of each one of these projects. But I really want to I want to commend you for mentioning, um, you know, the, um, you know, CMEX, which is the uh, one of the largest cement companies in the world uh, headquartered in Monterey, Mexico. Um, and, you know, the fact that they're it's interesting. I always think now that we all in real estate, there's so many players, right? There's so many, you know, uh, finance companies, architecture firms, developers, you know, how could we ever coordinate to be able to lower uh, the emissions uh, in a collective way? Look at the car industry, uh, you know, a sector there aren't that many players. So if they each, you know, make these commitments, we're going to be able to get there because we all can't make our own cars. There's only a certain number of these, these companies. Well, the fact is we all go back to about 10, you know, concrete and cement companies in the world. <laughs> and mm-hmm. the fact is to your point, if those 10 uh, go toward zero carbon uh, concrete, uh, then we actually, it will impact all of us. So we can all have our strategies. We need to have those strategies, but we need to look at all the way deep down in our supply chains because actually there are only a few players in some of these areas. And with the right kind of encouragement that, look, if you do it, we're going to we are your customer and we will spec that. Um, And as we know, you know, with uh, greater demand, there's going to be also the kind of pricing that will be advantageous eventually as we all move in this direction. But I also agree with the fact CMEX and Heidelberg and Wholesome and all of the, you know, top cement companies, they're hearing us, you know, they're moving pretty quickly, but probably not as quickly as we need them to move. So, Andy, um, Diane was just talking about embodied carbon what's actually in the building, which is a big focus of yours. Talk for a moment so people understand the difference between operating carbon and and embodied carbon and the split as it relates to CO2 emissions and where you can help both on the build side and then also on the operating side. Embodied carbon is what it takes to make the products that go in our buildings, make and ship and construct the products that go in a building. So using the example of cement that you were just talking about, the embodied carbon cement, is, like Diane was saying, is extremely high. So we're constantly researching materials that have lower embodied carbon. For example, we're working on many buildings now that are built out of wood and not out of steel. And they're called timber buildings. And it's been very successful. How high can you build? How high can you go with timber? I mean, we, we, in the apartment build, in the apartment industry, we talk about stick built, right? And we and we sit there and look at stick built buildings. But if you were to think about it in other applications, how high can you go? It's innovating all the time. We're we're working on a twelve story right now, and going really? from there, they're talking right now of, with some new innovations that are occurring up to twenty stories and maybe even twenty five stories within a few years. So it's it's really changing and modifying right now. But the difference, the the big difference is you have the embodied carbon and then the operational carbon is just as important because after you and I finish designing and, and, and investing in buildings, the building operates. And so we're measuring the operating carbon that's created by the buildings we create, ensuring that, for example, a lot of the buildings we're designing today have indoor outdoor spaces with much more outside air coming into the building so that they're not hermetically sealed buildings anymore, things like that. So there's operating carbon and embodied carbon together. That's what we're focused on right now as an industry to really make sure that our buildings in the future, again, by 2030, are net zero. And we're seeing the codes changing, especially across the United States right now. And here in California, where I am, the codes are radically changing. Then in the next few years, most buildings will be mandated net zero. And and on that, Andy, if uh, the, are people like Carrier who are building HVAC systems trying to so operating carbon i think is 72 percent of emissions and and the embedded is 28 percent. so really it's on the ongoing operating cost of the buildings that is the big emitter are people like i'm just trying to think about if a carrier does something to become more efficient to cut down on that 72 percent. are they getting if you will um promoted by or selected by Gensler to say, this building works with a carrier HVAC system, which is going to cut down on ongoing emissions going forward? Or is that really up to the developer of the building to sit there and say, yeah, I like the new carrier product, but I'm going to go with X? 
again, we're in Pat, we're, we're in 56 offices and literally 17 countries around the world, worked on over 100 in 100 countries last year. So our impact on the global footprint, we're impacting millions upon millions of people's lives is really important to us. So we're focused on the manufacturers big time right now. In fact, we sent out letters that we want to see their specifications to all the different uh, manufacturers that are out there right now. And they're responding back to us, showing us that in order for Gensler to spec their products, they have to meet certain standards. So absolutely for our firm and for our industry, the manufacturers are a big part of the supply chain for, for operational and embodied carbon. And at the end of the day, you're seeing your clients ask for this. So how many clients are you all going to where they say, build us a new headquarters and there's no environmental concern? Because one of the big, I mean, I was I was listening, I think it was Paul Tudor Jones who I was listening to, and he was saying, you know, ESG is super important, but it's become way too politicized. And he was like, you got to remove the environmental on the E and move it, you know, it should be S-E-G or S-G-E, but it shouldn't be ESG because everyone hears environment at the beginning and they say it's a bunch of tree huggers and and, and they they kind of get turned off by it, whereas it's so super important to the future of not only business, but the future of our world. Do you all have any clients who show up and say, I'm not going to pick on any industry, but just says, you know what, that's not even a concern of ours. Just go build it however you're going to build it. Yeah, look, every, you know, there's a whole spectrum, right? And so you've got all the way in one end and all the way in the other end. And our job is to work with all of our clients to help them to understand um, you know, how their building can help them achieve their goals. Because what is interesting is that, you know, you have all these goals that people have come, you know, saying that their company is, you know, going to use clean water by 2040 and not do this or do that. But at the same time, when they are going to build that headquarters, they don't see how all these things connect up. They look at their real estate as something kind of over here, but all of their goals and environmental strategies or things they want to do uh, for the future, uh, that how does the building play a part? So we really help them to unpack that, to realize that, you know, they've they have these goals. Also, they're trying to recruit, you know, the next generation who really is looking for this kind of a company and these kinds of spaces and places that they want to work in. How do you bring that all together in this new headquarters? And so, you know, again, what we find mostly is if there's, you know, are there going to be financial barriers to doing any of these things? And are there going to be time constraints? Are there going to be supply chain issues? And this comes back to, you know, what you were asking about, Does can we just all, you know, single spec one product, let's say carrier? Well, no, we need to have competitive bids on everything. So at the end of the day, that's why we, as Andy was saying, are working with manufacturers across the board because you know we don't want a single source of product so that we're not going to give our our client the advantage of you know the best pricing we need to have multiple choices in terms of which you know how the performance gets achieved um so that now look that's something Gensler is doing that's something we have the opportunity to do because of our scale look you know we're in, in an industry where 99% of firms are, you know, five people and less. And there's only a few firms that are, you know, of our size. And we are clearly, you know, out there kind of by ourselves at the scale that we're at. Well, we see that as, you know, one, an, uh, an opportunity to lead and to really help, you know, our industry and our, our partners across the ecosystem uh, to do what we can do because we do have the scale. We have the relationships. We are working with every manufacturer, I guarantee you. And we're able to, you know, share this is where we're headed and these are our goals. And we're not trying to pull the rug out from anyone and say, we're not going to use you on our jobs. We're like, look, in about a year, we're going to be coming out with a standard. And this is where we're seeing it. Do you, How do you think you can get there? And we work with them and we help them to get there. As you know, I think Andy mentioned, we put out the Gensler product standards, which has reverberated across the industry. Other architects are now using it. Suppliers are coming back to us and saying, you know, we can't meet it this year, but we're going to have something coming out next year that's going to meet the Gensler standard. You know, again, being a firm that recognizes that we can have that kind of influence to help our clients 
be able to have the projects they want at the price that they can afford. I would I would add one thing really quickly. Yeah. Is the, you know, we're talking about bricks and mortar, but at the end of the day, when CEOs come to Diane and I and our people, it's about people and attracting talent. And today, the Gen Xs, they're looking for the purpose of their organization to be around sustainability and, and the environment. And the spaces we're creating represent those companies in their push and their pursuit to be for green strategies. So I, we're seeing it more, like you mentioned, Willie, really, we're seeing our clients come to us saying, hey, we want to design a building of the future. We want to design a building that's sustainable and responsible. And it's part of their ethos as much as it is us saying bricks and mortar matter. So it's a perfect, uh, I wanted to ask the question about modular and why modular hasn't gain traction, if you will. Um, and I think about Katera and the the quite, you know, sizable failure that Katera was. But before I jump to that, because I'm not going to get this point in unless I ask it now, it, Diane was talking about the scale that Gensler has. And it made me think about, and she said, most of our competitor firms are like five people. Is the era of the star architect, the Saarinen, the Gary, the Johnson, is that a thing of the past? Um, and is the future more of firms like Gensler, where you've got hundreds of wildly talented, thousands of wildly talented architects, but that the design has to come together with other components of the build and that it's not just a, I'm going to go hire some star architect. Um, and I guess, I, I mean, I sort of think about it in the legal profession. You know, there used to be a number of lawyers who could have like boutique firms that like would get hired and they'd be like, I want that lawyer. And today it seems like if you go and hire one of the big firms, you just know that there's going to be a standard of capability there that you're good with almost anyone in the firm. Is the same thing happening in architecture? Or do you think that we still have an era of star architects in our future? I think I think it's both. I think their star architects are still out there, but I think we're the antithesis of that. Our firm was started about creating a flat global platform around the world, an entrepreneurial global platform where we believe that innovation comes from people from a diversity of thinking, not from in one individual, but a diversity of thinking, people that come from different cultures, different backgrounds, different geographies. And from that, we're able to provide our clients ideas from around the world for their project individually. So on any one project, I was on a call this morning where we have a project in Australia that's being designed in LA and London. So we're getting the best ideas from around the world for that particular client. We believe that also about being local is really important, that not just designing generically where all the work goes back to one location, Again, we're in we're in 17 countries. Last year, we worked in 100 countries, and we believe that being local and understanding the local design and what goes into those designs is really, really important. But that's where innovation comes from. Innovation comes from the diversity of ideas, not just one person's idea. And that's what we're coalescing every day around our firm, around the world. And, and how challenging is it to sort of, if you will, manage client engagement? So let's just say hypothetically, you all have a great relationship with Walker and Dunlop and our team here. Let's say that I woke up tomorrow morning and said, instead of coming into office space and building out the type of office space you built for us here in Denver, as well as in Bethesda, I said, I want to go build a building and I want it to be really innovative and really wild and whatever else. How does my request for a build to suit get, if you will, staffed at Gensler, where I don't call up and say, I want... Judy Johnson or Joe Jones to design it for me. I don't know that. I want Gensler, but it's coming in and someone has the ability to create something basically from scratch. How does that get assigned? How do you how do you work that? Unlike some other firms where someone says, I want Frank Gehry to design my, and by the way, Frank Gehry, as you both know much better than I do, isn't the one who's going to be working on most of the work on that, on that design. But let's park that for a second. How does that work at Gensler? Yeah, look, you know, um, we really believe in relationships and, you know, every great project really starts with a, a great client relationship. We've got a great relationship with you, you know, Evan and the team here started it and then that grew and grew as it's gone to the other offices. And, you know, the ethos of our culture is one firm firm really thinking about and, and you know, this this idea that you know, we're one firm. 
6,000 people, is all these different capabilities across the firm. It's in our studios, it's in our offices, it's in our regions. And it's up to our teams to really, you know, frankly, bring together the dream team for that project. That's what, you know, our leaders are looking at. How do we make sure that we are bringing together the right capabilities? Let's say it's a headquarters, people who understand what what a headquarters is all about, not yesterday's headquarters, but the future, you know, this idea of community and culture, as we were talking about, but also, you know, how do we do it in a way that's about tomorrow and not just about today? And it might be in a particular location, as Andy said, I mean, you know, we did a, a job for you here and, in, in, uh, you know, in Bethesda, and then we're also with you in Denver, and we're also with you in Atlanta. Well, it's really important to have people on those project teams then know those locations as well, because we want to get through the city and we want to make sure that, you know, there's local nuance uh, as it relates to the design of those projects. So, you know, we see it as really about practice and expertise. We see it's about relationship. We see it's about design innovation and it's about being local. I'll add to that, Willie, just really quick. If yeah. Okay. There, there are four key sectors that we're involved in. So if, if you wanted to build a suit in a specific industry, we have a practice area that's focused on that. So we have four sectors. The four sectors are work, which we talked about a lot in workplace, lifestyle, which is sports, hospitality, retail, all the practices around, around uh, lifestyle. And then we have what's called a city's practice um, market sector, which is life, you know, life sciences and airports and great projects like that. And finally, our health sector. So we, we're not only geographically based, but we're market sector based, based on expertise and providing that direct expertise. So if you had a project in a specific area, we'd immediately make sure that that practice area with all its market expertise and research is assigned to your project. And, and, and on that, Andy, of the four sectors, what's innovating the quickest? In other words, like, so for instance, as I looked at all the projects you're working on, you do a lot in athletics. You've built right. stadiums, you're building training facilities, you're building sports uh, arenas at, on university campuses. Seems like you all are, uh, you're building the new Under Armour, uh, you designed the new Under Armour headquarters in Baltimore. Um, you really seem to have a niche there as it relates to sports related build. Um, and then I think about life sciences and the amount of money that's going into life sciences and hospitals and research centers and all that. What industry from a, from a, physical space standpoint, and we've talked a lot about office here, is innovating the most where there's something that's very specific that Gensler needs to have or know that says, for us to build that research facility, you need to have this depth of knowledge about what's specific to that research facility to do it. Or to build that stadium, you need to have a team that can work with the city planning people because to build a stadium like BMO Stadium, which you all designed, you have to have X, Y, and Z. Which one is the most innovative right now? I think the answer to that question is, is coming out of COVID experience, people are looking for experience, all our clients are looking for experience. Everyone's yearning for those visceral experience. So if it's a sports stadium, we're innovating the fan experience. If it's a hotel, we're reinventing hotels for the guest experience. Over and over again, we're seeing in every single industry we're working in, it's really innovating and changing radically. We talked about work and workplace and how that's changing. If I was saying where our busiest areas are right now with most innovation, I'd say we're, you know, we have a huge aviation practice. We're designing literally 30, 40 airports around the world. And you know how much a airport travel has changed over the last several years. But in every single sector, our clients demanding because of the experience, because of creating uh, you know, multi experience multiplier for every potential industry. That's what we're seeing as the massive change. Uh, again, I, I, I would say, uh, and I would add one last area that we're massively changing again, and we talked about it at the beginning, is work. And work is massively changing. Think about the millions of square feet around the world that were built and antiquated and how that's totally being uh, reconfigured. And if I could just to just add on to that for a moment, um, you know, where it all kind of comes together is cities. I mean, I would say if if there's any place we all need to kind of, you know, really watch in terms of changes that are happening, it's it, I mean, it's happening because every topic we've talked about 
kind of uh, relates to cities. And, you know, uh, what's happening even with office um, is right at the core. I mean, it is it is hitting at the core, at the heart of our cities. And this reinvention and rethinking of cities is happening because of this, you know, again, kind of uh, uh, vacancy issue with office and valuation issue and value loss issue. But there's also an opportunity there, and whether it's residential, whether it's educational, whether it's, you know, again, kind of a tear down and something entirely different. But add to that the changes in transportation that are happening and mobility. You know, the fact that, you know, five years ago, six years ago, we probably none of us heard of a scooter, right? They are, there's scooters on our streets. There's e-bikes on our streets. There's, you know, again, bicycles. Then there's cars. Then there's the, you know, the autonomous vehicle as well. All of these modes of transportation need a place. And in many ways, they need something different than what we have today. So we really believe strongly that, you know, cities are going to undergo massive transformation over the next five to 10 years. But cities are really important. Our, our practice, our firm is, is very focused on cities. It's where our projects are, but it's where people live. Over half the world now lives in cities. And certainly in the U.S., that number is probably close to 70 percent are in, are in cities, large and small. We're not just saying large cities, but this also is suburban areas. This is rural areas, places that people call home and their community and how they're changing is is something that we're all going to be part of in the real estate ecosystem. Andy, I heard you talk about AI and AVs transforming our world. We all know that AI, and I'll get to AI in two seconds in the time we have left, but on AVs, I'm taking the, I'm taking the over on um, when we're going to have autonomous vehicles running people around. I've heard you say, look, first of all, I'll remind you of what Elon Musk said in 2015, which was that we'd have autonomous vehicles in the United States by 2020. We're now in 2024 and we're still doing Waymo, you know, Way- Waymo tests in, in, in San Francisco and almost getting Waymo taken out of business because of a car running into wet cement. Interesting how these conversations all loop back together. Anyway, um, you say by 2030, we're going to have autonomous vehicles changing the landscape of cities in the United States. What do you know about what's going on? It's actually not Detroit. It's it's more Uber and Google and Waymo that are that are making this happen. What do you know that I don't know that says that we're going to get a fully functioning autonomous vehicles in the next six years? What, what Whether it's 2030 or 2035 or 2040, it's coming our way. And the, the idea that AI now with AI combined with autonomous vehicles, we're going to have this massive change that's going to occur. And like Diane said, change the face of our cities. Think about it for an architect and urban planners, the ability to take our city streets back for people. Because when we do have autonomous vehicles, we won't need all the parking spaces that occur in our cities. Just think about taking all those side side parking spaces and creating green space or amenity space or dining spaces on our streets, which we saw during COVID. The ability to, you know, that AVs are going to really change our world and how we utilize our cities. We're going to be able to create back to creating walkable cities, you know, amenity rich cities that aren't based on CO2 filled cars. So I think what I, you know, from everyone that I'm talking in the industry and a lot of people working this, working on this, like you said, whether it's six years or 10 years or 15 years, it's coming and it's going to change the way we think about cities, it's going to think about a city like Copenhagen, where it's mostly about people and walkable versus the cars dominating our city streets. One last point. Think about in the United States, there are 175,000 gas stations in the United States. Think about that prime real estate. There will no longer be a gas station. It might be battery changing stations or it might be a community center or a green space, but it's not going to be gas stations. So literally, it's going to transform the face of our cities of the future. And we're at the cusp and right at the beginning of looking at what that means for our cities of the future. It's it, uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to think about how it will. You, you all talk about the 20 minute city of being able to access everything within 20 minutes of where you live. Um, I was with Phil Washington, who runs the Denver Airport Authority yesterday. And by the way, I don't know whether you all are working with 
the, with DIA, but you ought to be because there's a lot going on. It's the fastest growing airport in the United States. Um, the Army designed their hotel. The, the grand oh, that, hotel. oh, I love that hotel. Um, although I've never stayed there. It's fun to look at as I drive into the airport on an all too frequent basis. Um, but one of the things he was talking about was that they're, they're going to get rid of all the, um, uh, the rental car lots. And they're going to build a big rental car facility that will, it's got some unbelievable number of vehicles in it. I mean, literally, like, I think if I say 80,000 vehicles, I'm not sure that I'm overstating the number. It's like unbelievable. Maybe it's not quite that many, but it's just a mind blowing number. But he said, and then we'll have all this vacant land that today is filled up by all the rental car lots. And what we do with that, we're trying to think about whether we do hotels or whether we do this or that. My mind went to, I don't know what kind of electricity feed DIA has, but something would tell me that it's got a lot of electricity going to the airport. If they've got cheap electricity that is dedicated to the airport, they would put a data center there, but that's a whole different conversation. Um, Diane, as, as I, I want to get back to the thing that I started on with the two of you, because I find it to be so interesting in how you built the firm. I said at the beginning, and when you go on your website, you don't see all the different incredible buildings that you all have built. You see the people. You see the people. And the two of you have set up this great partnership for over 20 years that has allowed you to guide and grow this firm exceedingly successfully. And you've now turned it over to Elizabeth and Jordan, who are tasked with stepping into your shoes. I guess the hard question I think I have for you is, what makes you think that the two of them can operate in a partnership mode as successfully as the two of you did? And I'll only use one example. The partners of Carlisle, David Rubenstein and his partners, they created Carlisle as a partnership. And these three very talented individuals grew Carlisle to be this great firm. And they said when it was time to pass the reins, they said, we were a partnership. Let's create co-CEOs and have them manage it the same way we did. And I don't know whether you know the history of Carlisle, but that co-CEO role didn't really work. And actually, one of the co-CEOs is now the governor of the state of Virginia. Um, but I guess my question to you is, is it that there's something unique about Gensler that should make Elizabeth and Jordan successful? Okay. Is it male, female, or is it just wishful thinking that they can have a partnership like the two of you have created? <laughs> Wow, you could have sent us that one ahead of time. <laughs> Sorry. And by the way, I mean obviously you all this there, there's a there's a real reason why you've done this, but I but I looked at it and I said, "Wow, they've had a partnership that defied odds, honestly. It did. And now you're you're doing it again." Well, look, you know, let me share a bit. Andy can jump in as well. You know, I think that uh, it's all it's it's really it is the firm. I mean, I I think we would say this is our culture. You know, it's about collaboration and it's not like, oh, let's try this here. And then that was sort of unique in the firm. Every role in our firm is a co, as we call it. <laughs> um, you know, it's it, we have co-office leaders, co-regional leaders, co-practice area leaders. It is the, the sort of lifeblood of our firm, collaborative leadership. It is, um, uh, you know... Again, for our firm, and we we talk about our culture being the secret sauce. And one of the uh, you know ways that that comes to life is in this kind of a leadership model. It's a recognition that you know two plus you know one plus one equals five. It's not one plus. To me, you know, and Andy, I think did a great job talking about how we think about teams. And it's the same way that we think about leadership teams. You don't want two of the same people because then it's one plus one equals one, right? If, and I don't know what Car Carlisle did, but my guess is they tried to get two people who were similar rather than really optimizing on the fact that, you know, having two very different people means that you get m many more ideas. You have the opportunity to, to build on a multiplicity of strengths and, you know, again, like I always like to say, you know, we have 48 hours in a day instead of 24. The, uh, the increase in bandwidth, if you really trust each other and that each of you are decision makers rather than having to come back and loop back on everything. So, you know, again, it's it really is what the firm is all about. And, you know, as you said, Andy and I, we started together in 2005 as, as co-CEOs, but we had worked together. Uh, as part of the firm's management committee for 10 years prior to that. So we were already really good friends. Uh, we even had a couple of uh, moments of, of 
projects. We'll tell you about our White House project one day. Um, but it's what brought me and Andy together. Um, but, you know, we we basically it, when we started as co-CEOs, the, the firm might have been a 200 million a year enterprise. Now we're a two billion a year enterprise. We've grown, you know, to over 6,000 people and over 50 offices. And really, you know, there's so much in terms of Andy and I and our team, because there's a huge, a much larger team beyond the two of us that you see that has these incredible shared values, a shared vision, and then an array of skills and capabilities that are just, you know, again, uh, world-class, extraordinary individuals. So I, I think that it's it's our, you know, um, this sense of the strength of what it means to be diverse. Art Gensler, our founder, he had a group of people around him who were very different than him. We believe in that kind of idea of a model of people who are strong and different and committed to the same values and standing in, you know, as a, as a unified team, it's, it's powerful. And it's, you know, we believe strongly that Elizabeth and Jordan are going to be extraordinarily successful as well. And, and I'll add that, you know, this is based on a philosophy that we talk a lot about, Willie, about people, everyone, everyone has aces and spaces, things you're great at and not so great at. And what we do is we focus on people's aces. So Diane's aces are very, very different. Once you get to know, it's very different than my aces. But you put the two of us together with our different aces, like Diane said, one plus one equals five, and the sparks fly. Because there's an incredible amount of trust, respect, integrity that we've developed over the last 20 years. We've been working with Elizabeth and Jordan for that amount of time also on the next generation. So it's this idea that we talk about it all the time, diversity of thinking that I brought up before. The idea that half our board are women. You know, we we focus on the diversity because it's really important because we want to scale. We In order to create and solve some of the big challenges of the world, like climate change, like the future of cities, like the future of work, you can't have it based on one, one individual. It has to be a flat organization. And that's what we've tried to build, like Diane said, when we first came in, we were about $200 million company. Now we're a $2 billion company. But it's not about us. It's about the we. It's about the collective. It's about all of us together. We sink or swim together at the end of the day. Like Diane said, we're a one firm firm, one integrated practice around the world. And it shows. And it shows. Um, we're out of time. I have loved this. I'm, I'm so appreciative of the partnership that our firms have with one another. Diving into these issues, it was fascinating for me to do some real research on Gensler and see what you all have done and how you've gone about doing it. I've also learned a bunch about what we might think about doing here at WMD on a number of different things. Um, thank you both for your time. Um, uh, have a great time in your co-chair roles. Good luck to Elizabeth and Jordan in their new co-CEO roles. It doesn't sound like they need a lot of luck, but uh, it'll be great. And um after we do Atlanta, we got to figure out what the next project's going to be. Yeah. Um, so thank you both. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you again next week on the Walker Webcast. Thank you both. Thank you, Ellie. Bye. So much. Bye. Appreciate it a lot.